Hello, I'm Professor Peter Gazal, and I would like to welcome you to the Project Sepsis webinar, giving first-hand accounts from doctors, patients and scientists about the direct links between COVID-19 and sepsis. There are three key take-home messages we would like you to take from this webinar. The first is the seriousness of COVID-19 and the importance for all for keeping safe, especially for those that are most vulnerable. Secondly, how a maladapted immune response underlies the severity of disease in COVID-19. That is, by definition, a specific form of viral sepsis, similar to but distinct from bacterial sepsis. Thirdly, for those that are fortunate to recover from severe COVID-19, their recovery is long, but critically, they are at much higher risk for getting sepsis, either from a bacterial or a viral infection. I'm sure you'll find these presentations informative, and for some, I hope not too distressing. After the talks, we will be hosting a live Q&A session. So it's about uh, eight o'clock at night. I've just arrived at the car park in Cardiff to start my second night shift in a row. Uh, last night was pretty busy with critically ill people with COVID and with not COVID. I'm not wearing any works clothes today, which feels a bit weird. So I'll be dressing into scrubs or a surgical outfit when I go in, so I don't have to take dirty clothes home with me. I've tried to listen to something different on the radio on the way, rather than the news or a, a podcast about medicine. I've put some easy listening acoustic music on the way, and I think that's been fairly good. Anyway, there's a long 13 hours ahead of us. There's not many cars in the car park, actually. It's uh, Sunday night, and I will see you all in the morning. Hi everybody, my name is Matt Morgan. I'm an intensive care doctor working in Cardiff and thank you for asking me to talk a little bit about the science, the tough times, as well as those glimmers of good through the COVID-19 epidemic as we saw in the intensive care unit. There you've just seen an actual video diary from at the time before I started a shift. And in those early phases of the pandemic, we were really in that preparation phase. We were anticipating, as an intensive care community, a disease that was mainly a disease of the lungs, a pneumonia, a viral pneumonia. And that's how we started treating that disease in those early times. However, what we now know, and what now we understand, is that this isn't just the disease of the lungs, of course. Much like other problems that can cause sepsis, whether it's meningitis, whether it's an infection after surgery, or whether it's a pneumonia like COVID-19, this of course causes a multi-system disease affecting not only the lungs, but the kidneys, the heart, the brain, and critically, the immune system. We know now that COVID-19 is important, not just because of the virus itself, but crucially, the way that that virus interacts with different people's immune systems in different ways, causing different outcomes. What we did know, sadly, at those early times is that the outcomes for some with this disease were sadly not good. That includes not only people unable to survive, but even those long-term outcomes, as we'll see later. In intensive care, sadly, survival and death is something that we are sadly too familiar with. And as we will see, it's often those times of humanity, as well as the science, which can be tough. This is definitely not how I was expecting to be spending Easter. It's gone midnight on Easter Sunday. It's another tough shift in intensive care and it's been a, a really hard one tonight for staff and for patients and absolutely for patients' families. Uh, we've sadly had somebody who's died 
and their family couldn't be with them at the time. They asked whether we can hold their hand, which we did, and uh, whether we could play their favourite song, which we did uh, at their bedside. But it must be so hard for them not being here. It's not how I expected to spend Easter, it's also my wife's 40th birthday uh, in a day or so, and to be completely honest, I haven't done very much for her. <laughs> I've ordered some last minute presents, but they haven't arrived because the post is delayed. I had organised a surprise party for her, but that's obviously cancelled now as well, so I'm feeling pretty guilty about not supporting my children, because it's Easter, and my wife. Uh, perhaps as well as I should have done, but I'm here trying to support patients, families, staff, the NHS to get through COVID. Let's hope next Easter is very different. So yes, COVID-19 has presented huge challenges for science, for medicine, for the economy, for the world. And one of the huge challenges is dealing with the human side of this disease especially for those that sadly die, sometimes when loved ones or family members couldn't be there. And that was a big eye-opener for the way that we have to interact with families and the way that medicine has to interact with thoughts around survival and death as a whole. One thing that did happen through COVID-19 was an explosion in rapid, important, impactful research. And this has huge lessons for other areas of medicine, including sepsis. Fairly uniquely, what we were dealing with in this scenario and what the research trials were dealing with was a single disease. There are many syndromes we deal with in medicine, sepsis being one of them, which consists of different diseases all put together. However, in COVID-19, we took an approach looking at one single disease. This has many analogies, much like cancer. Whilst in the past, cancer was seen as a whole, now we can look, research, and deal with cancer as specific different entities, all the way down to the individual genetic differences in different tumor types. Therefore, it was no surprise in a way, when we were doing high quality research studies in a rapid manner on a single disease, a single entity, we have thankfully found some treatments which help and which work. Dexamethasone for example as a steroid can reduce the risk of death in people on life support machines by as much as a third. That is dramatic, huge and something that in sepsis we haven't found impactful treatments like that before in the past. So I think we can learn from that by using single entities to research rather than syndromes as a whole. One other important aspect that has come out is the acceptance of the public and patients to be included in high quality, well organised, safe research. Only then can we make big differences. And I hope in the future people will see inclusion in these kind of research studies, not only clinical research, but scientific research with academic institutions looking at the basic science of a disease as a good. It should be something that we strive towards making a normal part of care, inclusion in high quality trials. Well, it's 12, 13 hours after I last sat in this car and turned the engine off and uh, here we are again. It's pretty dark actually. In fact, I'm gonna turn this light on so you can see a bit better. Uh, it's been a strange day today. It's been a day of two halves. In some ways, people are getting used to the rhyme and the reason of the day. They're getting faster with putting on the PPE. They're getting familiar with the way patients respond who are critically ill with this disease. So they've been all really good point points. It's also been a tough day, and it's been a tough day because today is the first time where people have lost a colleague. Uh, somebody who we all know fairly well uh, has died. Someone who has worked in the hospital for a long time and that's always going to set people back. It'll make us think about them and their family. And it also makes you realise that this is a disease which we're all vulnerable to. No matter if you work in the hospital, don't work in the hospital. It's, and that makes you think, especially now as I 
uh, drive home to see the family and my uh, two girls. Anyway, I'm going to put some music on. I'm going to maybe even sing and uh, get back home. And so we've seen some of the difficult, tough aspects of COVID-19, from the understanding of the science, which rapidly evolved, to the way that we had to deal with unexpected challenges of humanity, such as loss through COVID-19 in intensive care. But it's important to remember there were glimmers of hope, glimmers of good in those times which were tough and which were bad. It was important when working there as a doctor, as a nurse, as an anaesthetist, as a porter, as a cleaner, to also try to find some joy in your life. As you heard, it was my wife's birthday, it was a sunny time of the year, and I couldn't just go to work and think about all those tough things. You also have to find glimmers of joy, glimmers of good, in order to deliver your best in the long term. And that's the same for the rest of society. There were also glimmers of good in terms of the way people worked together in hospitals as a team. They worked cross-discipline, not only between doctors, nurses, anaesthetists, intensive care doctors, but also between academic institutions and healthcare institutions. And I hope those links will continue more and more into the future. As a final part in, I had kept a short diary during COVID-19 and I just want to read you the last entry that I actually made in that diary. And this entry says, Nye Bevan, one of the founding fathers of the NHS, said that the purpose of power was to give it away. This crisis has been fought not only with nurses, the cleaners, the doctors, the care workers, the delivery drivers, but by all people, by you all. Thank you all. We have also had the power to choose our future. And now sometimes we can seem in a hurry to return to normal. And yet we all should be in a hurry to remember which parts of normal are really worth returning to. Thank you. Hello, my name is Davide Compagnone and I would like to tell you about my journey through severe COVID-19. Everything started on uh, Good Friday, Friday the 10th of April. I remember I was with my little daughter when I suddenly felt lightheaded. I took my temperature and it was around 37.8, 37.9 degrees. At that particular moment, I thought it could have been COVID because of my job. I'm a hospital pharmacist and in the, in the weeks leading to Easter, I was covering the wards with COVID patients, COVID positive patients. Anyway, I wasn't really worried because I knew that majority of people usually experience mild symptoms they usually resolve within a week, 10 days. After a few days, along with temperature, I started with dry cough. After another few days, I started to experience quite severe shortness of breath. That was around Saturday, the 18th of April. So eight, week, eight days after the onset of the very first symptom. At that moment then, I was uh, particularly worried because I've never experienced shortness of breath in my life, gasping for air, trouble sleeping. So on Sunday, the 19th of April, I decided that I needed to seek uh, medical attention. I drove myself to Lambda Hospital. I presented in front of uh, medical admission units. And I clearly remember that a nurse came out, took my temperature, it was around 40 degrees and I was admitted straight away. After that, I was put on facial oxygen mask to try to relieve my shortness of breath. I had a CT chest that didn't show any pulmonary embolism, but showed a quite evident and clear hyperinflammation of my lungs. And I was admitted on a general ward, ward one. I was put prone on my uh, belly to help me breathe and uh, didn't really help. So around midnight, a few hours after my emissions, 
I was uh, told that I was going to be put on mechanical ventilation uh, from an ITU doctor. At that time, I was pretty relieved, pretty relieved because I thought that at least I could have a, a little bit of rest after a few days of trouble sleeping and severe shortness of breath. Darkness started then for me. What I'm going to tell you is what other people told me about my clinical journey because I was deeply sedated, so I don't have any sort of recollection of memory of my staying at you. On mechanical ventilation, I understand that I didn't improve or deteriorate particularly. After a few days, Dr. Morgan, the intensivist that uh, was carrying me, decided that I would benefit from a procedure called ECMO, extracorporeal membrane oxygenation. So he laced with St. Thomas's Hospital in London, where they usually have this machine and they usually have a specialized team um, that uh, follow people on ECMO. And uh, on the following Friday, a vascular surg surgical team came from London to put me on ECMO and brought with them back to London in St. Thomas's. I was on ECMO for a few days, four or five days. My conditions started to improve a lot. So I was decannulated from ECMO first and then extubated. I was pretty fine. So my sedation was reduced up to completely, um, was, was, uh, my sedation was reduced in London. And I started to be aware of what happened to me and uh, where I was. I was told that I was in London. I was told briefly what happened. But at that time, I couldn't retain any information or understand properly what was going on around me. I was delirious. I experienced quite a vivid delirium with uh, discomfort discomforting images and uh, I would say vivid, strange fantasies for a few days after my sedation was completely weaned off. So on a Friday, two weeks after my admissions, I was repatriated in Cardiff, brought back in ITU, but luckily at that moment, the worst was past. I remember uh, the ITU room in, at the Heath and um, I remember that I was still a little bit delirious in Cardiff, but I was uh, pretty cautious to finally have a chat and a conversation with my family. So I remember my very first call with my wife and with my parents and sister in Italy. It was emotional. It was really, really emotional. I remember that they struggled not to cry in front of me. And uh, I remember I was, um, I was pretty, pretty, um, was pretty strange for me because I was uh, slow in my talking, still a little bit confused, but alive, alive. That is the important thing. Anyway, in ITU, I started my recover. In ITU at the Heath in Cardiff. And after a few days, I was transferred in, uh, into a respiratory ward in a room with other COVID-19 survivors. At that time, then, I was completely aware. I had quite a lot of uh, checks and follow-ups while I was on that ward. I had physiotherapy for a few days, but luckily I regained the ability to work on my own without aid in two, three days, so it was pretty quick. I had an assessment from a stroke occupational therapist, because unfortunately a CT scan of my brain in London showed a lacunar infarct. So I was assessed to see if there was any neurological disorder or any cognitive impairments, but luckily none of them were present. And um, on the 13th of May, so after three weeks of my admission, I was finally discharged. Came back home, it was pretty emotional. All my neighbors were on the streets cheering and uh, clapping their hands and crying. 
So it was a quite, quite intense and emotional moment for me. My recovery started then after the discharge. I was uh, weak and uh, I was um, uh, with a little bit of shortness of breath for two, ten day, two, sorry, two weeks, 10 days after my discharge. I anyway tried to uh, exercise slightly every single day. I went out for little walks, increasing the time, 10 minutes the first time, 50 minutes, 30 minutes, an hour, two hours, and so on. So I would say with, uh, within, uh, I would say three weeks, I regained a pretty decent level of functionality around the house and uh, around, uh, um, I regained a pretty um, quite level of functionality um, in doing uh, chores around the house and uh, uh, doing a little bit of works uh, just in my neighborhood's area. I then in that period had a lot of follow-ups as you can imagine, chest x-rays for my lungs, follow-up clinics for my stroke and mental health clinics as well. And uh, um, it was a quite uh, intense period of follow-ups. More or less every day I had a conversation with a healthcare professional but about my health. After nearly four months being home, I decided that it was time for me to go back to work. So at the end of July, I go back to work on a phase return and I'm still on a phase return. I'm cautious that I'm still don't have my pre-COVID levels of energy. So I have to take it easy. I don't have to push too far for myself. And, and that's it. And now I'm, uh, I'm uh, pretty fine in myself, physically and mentally speaking. I, I'm working, I'm back to work. And um, I just uh, would like to share my story with everyone that could be interested to pass two main messages that are really personal and important for me. First message, don't be blasé with COVID-19. It is uh, it's still there yet. It's, it's not over yet, sorry, it's not over yet. Um, we have to be cautious. We have to respect all the measures in place, social distancing, hand hygiene, surgical masks. So please don't be blasé with uh, COVID-19. And second message is, if you think about COVID-19, think also about sepsis. I was going to that route. At a certain point, I developed a secondary bacteremia in ITU and I was given meropenem. So I know that every infection can lead to sepsis. So please, please, if you think about COVID-19, think also about sepsis. Thank you. Thank you for listening to me. So, hi, I'm Fergus Hamilton, and as you can see, I'm one of the doctors in infection here in North Bristol NHS Trust, and I'm also a PhD student in the Project Sepsis team at Cardiff University, um, and a clinical researcher in, in infection. And I'm here to talk really about coronavirus and diagnostic testing, and a bit about why coronavirus causes disease. Um, so, I, I suppose to sort of start really the interesting question is is why does coronavirus cause disease and like any pathogen there are kind of two main mechanisms of disease and the first is direct damage by the pathogen so viruses use host cells to for their own machinery so viruses get into host cells co-op the the machinery that host cells normally use to make their own things and make more viruses and clearly along the way that that damages the cells one of the receptors that we've, we've identified on host proteins, uh, host cells, is called ACE2. And the virus does, does use that to get into cells. And it does appear that that does cause some of the, explain some of the lung damage that where we've seen in patients with coronavirus, because there's lots of cells with ACE2 in the lungs. And that's how we commonly think bugs cause disease. Um, I suppose the second thing is about the immune response. And this might sound like a bit of a strange thing if you, if you don't know a lot about infection but actually much of the damage caused in infection is in, in trying to kill it 
And if you think that the immune system actually is really, really, really good at dealing with pathogens, so all the air we breathe, the air that you're breathing now, all the food you eat, all the things you touch, all of those contains bugs, that's viruses, that's bacteria, that's fungi. And 99.9 .9 times out of 100, the immune system manages to deal with them in a way that you don't even know about. And what happens in coronavirus, and this is very analogous to, to, to things like bacterial sepsis, and I think we can think of coronavirus as being like viral sepsis, is that the immune response is somehow heightened and overactive. And that is such that the immune response starts to cause some of the problems. So in targeting the cells that contain the viruses, there's, there's, there's sort of crossfire and other cells get damaged. And, and we know that for lots of reasons. Firstly, we see lots of inflammation in these patients. So patients with coronavirus have markers of inflammation that are quite high. And secondly, the, the strongest data we have from, from the trials from a trial called Recovery Run to the University of Oxford shows that steroids, which dampen the immune response, reduce mortality in patients with severe coronavirus. So we know that immune response is important. And, and the context of this is really about sepsis and thinking about how this is similar to other kinds of, of um, infections we see, severe infections, where the damage is a combination of both the direct pathogen damage and the response to it, a sort of sepsis-like response. I'm also going to talk a little bit in, in that context about diagnostic and laboratory testing. Now, if you don't know how diagnostic and laboratory testing, I'm actually in the laboratory here in, in uh, Bristol, it's actually much more complex than, than one might think. So this is just an example of what, what the normal process is, and I won't go through it all, but the important point is we have a very regulated and complex system by which Samples are actually processed electronically, often by robots, and they're often multiple phases. So it's actually quite complex to get the result from, the, from a patient all the way down to a, back to the clinician or back to the patient themselves. And in particular, the testing that we're kind of using, molecular testing often requires multiple stages and requires batch testing. So that means lots of tests are done at the same time, which often means that they have to be done in larger labs, such as the one here and ones in Cardiff too. So the main tests that we, we kind of use for coronavirus, just to go on to that really, is, is the most important one, I suppose, the one that was used initially in Wuhan and, and when we didn't know about coronavirus was clinical and radiological diagnosis. Patients who are sick, who are quite unwell with coronavirus have quite a characteristic clinical feature. In general, they're sort of unwell for a couple of weeks, usually around a week and a half, two weeks, with non-specific symptoms and then develop quite a dry cough fever and shortness of breath and they're quite specific chest x-ray changes. Now although that might seem slightly woolly to you when we actually looked back and we published our data from here looking at how accurate we were uh, clinicians were at diagnosing patients with coronavirus it really was quite good so this is actually a quite accurate way of picking up patients with coronavirus and the gut feeling clinicians should never be ignored in understanding how, how diagnostic strategies work really. The second kind of test that we most commonly use and the commonest test when you think about getting a coronavirus test is a PCR based testing. So it's sometimes called antigen testing. And this is a simple, I won't go into the details, but it's a, it's a testing where we take the DNA from a sample and we can take a sample from anything, from a nose, from a throat, from a blood test or anything. And we look for evidence of viral RNA, which is a sister of DNA really. And then we amplify up that RNA. We basically try and copy it repeatedly and then measure it. There's lots of ways of doing that, lots of commercial kits um, and lots of other ways we can do it. And that's something that we do in Public Health England, we do in Public Health Wales. And I suppose that has lots of advantages because it's quite quick. But the three main sort of disadvantages of this testing technique are, it relies on the presence of RNA or virus particles being there. So the reasons for having a negative test are number one, the sample taken might not be good enough. So you might try and take a sample, but not get any RNA from that. And that might be because the sample just you've taken is not a very good sample. You didn't get deep enough into the throat or the nose. Or secondly, that the virus isn't there. The virus might be lower up down in the, in the respiratory tract. And certainly earlier on in the pandemic, when we were seeing patients in our intensive care unit, we would often have negative tests from the nose and throat swabs but positive PCR tests from deeper in the lungs where the real virus was. And I'm bringing you back to what causes coronavirus disease. By the time many of these patients present, 
there may not be many much virus left and the damage may be caused by the immune system. So sometimes the testing, if we have a, a PCR test and it's negative, that doesn't necessarily mean the patient doesn't have coronavirus. And we've noticed that quite a lot. And that's because, as I say, the damage from the disease is caused by the immune system, not necessarily by the virus. So detecting the virus itself is not the ultimate feature of, and is a weakness of the sort of PCR testing rely on that. The reason I put multiplex here is that you can often do multiple, look for multiple respiratory viruses in the same sample. This is called multiplex testing. And this is quite useful, particularly it will be this winter when there's outbreaks of flu, uh, rhinovirus and other kinds of coronaviruses. We can test them all in the same panel. So that means we can get a result for, for one and that can be quite useful. So if you get a positive flu result, you know the patient is unlikely to have coronavirus. Early testing here in, in Bristol of all about 10,000 samples shows that co-infections infection with multiple viral pathogens is actually quite unlikely. So I think we can be quite confident that if we grow another virus that, that it's unlikely to be coronavirus. I think the final testing that we kind of use, which is more, um, you might have advised, antibody testing. Now antibodies are looking for the host immune response to infection. So antibodies are proteins made by parts of the immune system called B cells, um, which are just proteins that stick onto virus and kill it or, or help the immune system kill it. So the kind of the two testing strategies, PCR looking for the virus, antibody based, looking for the host response to the virus. There's a couple of problems with antibody testing. Firstly, it, it takes a while for the host to develop antibodies and not all patients do. So if you imagine you've seen a virus for the first time, it takes a while for the body to understand how to make an antibody and, and develop one that's good enough and produce high enough quantities for us to measure in the blood. And that's looking like sort of 14 to 21 days. So these are not particularly useful in, in acute infection. And for patients, particularly patients with, with blood disorders and patients with disorders of the immune system, they may not make antibodies at all. And that, that, that obviously was not good. This test is not going to be very good in someone who doesn't make antibodies. The third problem with antibody testing is actually that the commercial kits that have been developed to do antibody testing are not particularly reliable. That's because it takes a long time to develop a good antibody test. You know, many of the tests we commonly use for things like you know, chicken pox or HIV have been developed over years and years and years and got better. Whereas the tests that we're using have been developed over months. And we found that they are not particularly good at identifying patients, particularly with milder disease. That clearly will improve and I can already see that that is improving in the, com in the commercial market. I suppose the fourth problem with antibody testing is we don't understand what its implications are. One of the values of antibody testing in other viruses, let's say chickenpox, for example, is that you can be confident what a result means. So in patients with chickenpox, if they have a positive antibody to chickenpox, you know that they cannot get chickenpox again. And you can use that as a protective marker. And we commonly use that actually, particularly in pregnant women who are exposed to chickenpox to make sure that they are, are not at risk of developing chickenpox. We do not know what this means for coronavirus or COVID. And so antibody-based testing, although the, the technicalities of it may be being worked out and it may be coming into its full implications for understanding how to use the test and what happens to the antibodies is certainly not, not known at present. And the final thing about antibody testing is over time, antibodies wane. This is, this is normal in, in, in humans, um, particularly if you're not exposed to viruses again. When you get unwell, your, your body spends a lot of effort making proteins like antibodies um, and turns all the cellular machinery to try and make that. And over time, that becomes less and less useful. You want to do other things like normal things. And so your body stops making antibodies. But you still ma maintain the memory of how to make them, the sort of blueprints, if you will. Um, and what we don't know is how low your antibody gets in, in normal disease and, and the correlates sort of for immunity. So really antibody testing is, is something that's kind of in its infancy. It's something that we almost, the testing kind of outweighs our understanding of it at the moment, but it probably will become a useful, useful tool in the future. Finally, there's other testing strategies that are not commonly used in the laboratory nowadays, um, such as sequencing or looking for host gene expression. Um, these are all kind of novel ideas. No one yet has commercially produced a test that is reliable, although that's not to say that there aren't lots that are in the market. Um, and nearly all of these are sort of based on essentially trying to develop to identify the presence of the DNA, like a PCR-based test, 
all develop some marker of the host immune response, which brings us back to what, what is coronavirus really? It, it's caused by both of those things. So a combination of both tests is quite, quite helpful to diagnose coronavirus. So what are the sort of future directions really in, in, in COVID? So I think in, in, in diagnostics, particularly, we need to have a better understanding of, of how long antibodies take to develop and how long we should expect to find virus and perhaps what's the best combination of tests to use to identify if patients have coronavirus disease. And I think in terms of the sepsis picture, we really need to have a better understanding of how immune mediated damage works and what the mechanisms of that are. Like in bacterial sepsis, we are really just at the forefront of understanding why many patients, I mean, most patients with coronavirus and most patients with bacterial infection are quite well and don't have any problems, but a small percentage develop this overactive immune system. And why in the host, what, what changes that and what are the features of, of people that, that cause them to develop the severe immune mediated damage? And the consequences is just really from the, its infancy, something the Project Sepsis is sort of looking forward to work on. Um, Thank you. I hope that's been quite helpful. As I said, I'm Fergus Hamilton. I'm one of the infectious disease doctors here in North Bristol Trust. And I'm a researcher uh, as part of Project Sepsis in Peter Gazal's lab in Cardiff University. Um, thank you very much for your time. Good morning. My name is Dr. Luke Davis. and I'm a research associate at Project Sepsis. So today I'm going to be talking to you about the science behind sepsis and really focusing in on COVID-19, which is a type of viral sepsis. So how does the body respond to infection in general? And I've sort of drawn this as a castle idea where you have uh, the walls and the moat and the staff inside and bacteria cannot usually penetrate your walls or, or the moat, but sometimes uh, microbes such as bacteria will enter your, your body, your castle and talk to the staff there. And this is normal, this is part of the microbiome and it's important for a healthy immune system. However, if something gets in there which is going to cause some damage, um, it's called a pathogen and your cells know this and will call out to the immune cells, which is things like neutrophils, macrophages, phagocytes and NK, NK natural killer cells um, to come and help and they'll go into that tissue and generally destroy that virus or that bacteria or whatever's causing that pathogenic activity. So what happens when an infection is not detected? It gets out of control and takes over that tissue and does cause damage, but because it doesn't detect it that well, um, the signal is generally more broad, a help signal, which will recruit the same cells in, but they're not quite sure what to do with it as well. And sometimes they also need help. So they will ask to recall the army. And then this initiates a third wave of defense, which is really your returning knights from the army, flanking cavalry, which will come in but it will take a number of days for them to, to enact and really those soldiers are your only line of defense during that, that wait. So how is immune defense breached in severe COVID-19? Well, the first thing really is that lack of first antiviral response in that second wave. The staff aren't picking up that there's a problem. And this could be to do with tolerance, which is really part of the immune set point. Um, and also, um, you know, the virus itself or the bacteria itself could be trying to hide from the staff. And this can lead to an established infection, which then leads to a cytokine storm, which I'll explain in detail later. And then this can cause collateral damage to your body. The other way it can be breached is by having dysfunctional immunity, specifically in the third wave of immune defense, those nights. Now you can have a deficiency in T cells, which is caused by uh, low thymic output. So in age, your thymus size will decrease as you get older and you're not able to produce as many T-cells. Additionally, suppressive medication can stop the, the T-cells from working and to reduce the number of T-cells you have. And these T-cells are really the, the, the third wave nights of your immune system. Additionally, if you have a previous infection, it can cause damage. Additionally, the wrong cytokines, the wrong signals can be present, which will cause these cells not to work properly. Now I'm really today going to focus just on the lack of the antiviral response because a lot of these things, the cytokine storm, can lead to damage of your third wave immunity also. So one of the things that's been picked up in, in severe COVID-19 is the lack of type 1 interferons. And these are the, the virus warning signal that your cells will give out. This signal stops the virus from spreading directly, but also helps the soldiers of the immune system to destroy the virus. And patients with uh, severe COVID-19 lack these interferons, specifically the alpha and beta forms. 
And the reason is, is really to do with uh, immune set points, where your immune system is, is established to start with, how tolerant it is to, to microbes. And, you know, I've put this in a speech bubble here, you know, these staff saying it was just her again. Maybe they're used to this sort of infection and don't treat it as seriously as they should, especially for a new virus like um, the corona, new coronavirus. Additionally, if you've had a uh, previous infection or you have a comorbidity such as asthma, this can damage your, your, your ability to sense new illness and also to control it with those soldiers. So one of the consequences of, of failing to sense viruses and bacteria is, is a cytokine storm, which is, is essentially a non-specific response to some, some cellular damage. And this is an example of two patients. One has mild COVID-19, the other has severe. Um, the first patient has, has a, a range of signals, but really the main signal is that there is a virus present, can you please sort it out? And the response to that is to call the cavalry, call those knights in. Whereas patient two, the severe COVID-19, you can see there's a lot of mixture of signals. Um, there's not you know, any specificity of what's going on here. Um, so the message then is just to bring in the cannons and, and uh, try and kill whatever's there. And I'll show these as, as speech bells and warning, warning signals, but what these really are are cytokines, which are specific um, chemicals produced by your body, proteins in fact, and then they will give specific signals such as kill this virus or activate all immune cells. So these cytokine storms, when, when they get very unspecific and ca cause collateral damage to your immune system and to your body, and one of the cells which enact this are the neutrophil, which are really the immune system's cannons. They're actually the most common cell in your blood. They're recruited to sites of infection. So if you cut yourself and you can see pus, that is the, those cells. And if it's green, they're especially enriched in neutrophils. These cells eat foreign particles such as bacteria or even virus, which has been coated by uh, co uh, components of the immune system called complements. And this is called phagocytosis. They can also explode violently, dam damaging everything around them. This is called pyroptosis or netosis. And the best way really is to show you some videos of this. And this is a video of phagocytosis and you can see the neutrophil um, around this area and you can see it going towards this foreign particle, which in this case is a bacteria, but it could also be coated viral particles. And it will eat this, ingest it and destroy that particle. And then it will search for more and uh, it will eventually find this one over here. The other uh, mechanism is pyroptosis. And this is where the cell will explode releasing lots of toxic compounds. And you can see here, it's very violent. It actually destroys the nucleus of the cell itself and then expulses lots of damaging particles, which will activate cells next to it, cause a chain reaction. And this is generally quite damaging for your immune system, but it's very good for controlling things like a severe bacterial infection. You want this to happen in, in your pus. So the cytokine storming in COVID-19 actually can trigger pyroptosis. And this is some data showing normal healthy blood serum, which is a component of blood, um, put on some neutrophils, and the green is when those neutrophils have exploded. So, you know, these neutrophils are liable to explode when you put them on a dish sometimes, but when you add COVID-19 serum, serum from a COVID-19 patient, severe COVID-19, you can see a lot more of these cells start to explode, and this will then cause a, a chain reaction, um, which will enable other cells next to it to, to react and explode and, and then you're releasing dangerous cellular contents all over the system. And this is important because there are about 20 billion uh, neutrophils in a, the average COVID-19 patient's blood and another 100 billion are made per day. So you know, these cells do have the capacity to create a lot of damage, not just to your immune system, but to your organs too. So what lessons can we learn from COVID-19? It is a type of viral sepsis, but can we use this to predict and treat sepsis in general? So one of the things I briefly mentioned was immune set points. And I've, I've shown a, a little master control board here from an audio uh, studio. And you can see there's lots of switches and dials and rheostats really to, to control the immune system. And if we know where all these are set, do, can we predict who will develop sepsis? So for, in, for instance, if you get uh, a bacterial infection, um, you will slide one of these rheostats up and next time you see that bacteria, you'll be much more likely to respond to that bacteria in a positive way. But Newton's law really says that every action has an equal and opposite reaction. Uh, and therefore, if you increase the base, the treble is gonna suffer as a result. Um, maybe your antiviral immunity will suffer as a, as a result. So knowing these set points is very important 
um, in, in being able to, to predict who will develop sepsis. Now, how to treat it? So one of the ways uh, to treat these conditions is to control the immune signals. Now, traditionally, uh, this has been seen as stopping the cytokine storm, but perhaps we really need to fine tune this cytokine storm. So, uh, for instance, increasing things like interferon beta in viral sepsis, where this is very important for controlling viruses, while then depleting the cytokines, which are more general signals and will cause um, reaction. These treatments are used separately, but never, never really together. And this is a prime example where they can be used together. And so for COVID-19, one of the treatments is uh, nebulized interferon into the lung, um, which has promising results so far. And also anti-TNF-alpha can be used to, to block out those danger signals. And if you use them both together, perhaps you're gonna get a better response um, for the patient. So thank you for your attention. Um, and uh, this is a picture of the team. Um, a lot of the new people aren't on here and that's because of really the bad haircuts during COVID-19. So again, thank you for your attention. I would like to thank the speakers who have given us four very distinct personal and professional aspects of COVID-19 and sepsis. I'm sure you have questions and we are now open for a live Q&A session. Can you hear me now? Now, yes, can hear you now. Perfect. Sorry, hi, I'm Fergus Hamilton. I'm an infectious disease doctor in Bristol and I'm uh, also doing some research with Peter. And as you can see, I didn't do the talk with Luke, but we may as well have done the same thing from a different side. Yeah, so um, I'm Luke Davis. I'm a research um, a scientist at Project Sepsis. And yeah, I think there's a lot, lot of um, you know, underlying science to, to COVID, which is being published every single day and is really exciting. But yeah, um, certainly you know, Gus and I could have come up with a, a nice talk together. Hello, I'm Davide, COVID-19 survivor. Really happy to be here today and join this meeting. And it's, uh, as you can imagine, is a, is a personal matter for me, really. So, yeah, I just want to thank everyone for, for giving me the opportunity to be here today. Thank you. Hi, everyone. My name's Matt. I'm an intensive care doctor based in Cardiff. And again, thanks for including me in today. Wonderful to see so many attendances and wonderful to see David looking so well. You're muted, Peter. Okay, so we have some questions popping up on the screens. Actually, guys uh, on the panel, do you actually see the questions? Um, yeah. Yeah, I, I can, yeah. yeah. Yes, okay. I can. What I would like to do is just offer a free fall for those that would um, like to answer what, what you see up on the screen. If you can just repeat the question so that everybody can see and hear that and uh, give a response. So who would like to take the first question? Luke? I mean, I can't, I can't answer it very well, but I can certainly take it and I can read it out. Uh, so the question is, is the lack of interferon response specific to COVID or is it something that's observed in viral sepsis caused by other viruses? I have to say, I really haven't researched this um, personally, um, but I would imagine that it could be something that would be looked at. And I, I would guess that, yes, it would be shared by other viral sepsis, but I'd have no idea. I haven't really looked into that. Is anyone else? No? My gut feeling would be that it would be similar. Yeah, my gut feeling is that generally in severe infection, the, the severe patients have markers of sort of decreased immune function as well as excessive immune function, the time presentation. I think interferon you could see is like that, but I would be guessing <laughs> like Luke. I think unfortunately the reality is that uh, viral sepsis has been, com is, has been really underexplored. Um, and so I think those questions are not, are uh, yet to be answered. I, I suppose the second question here is, uh, thanks for all your good work from T. Rollingson. I'm curious about how you managed to stay working and collaborating during lockdown. Uh, well, I, I mean, I, I can only speak for myself as a, a physician and Matt might have a, a view as another physician as well. I mean, actually, it's been incredible in terms of the support from the national governments about doing research. We've been really supported both uh, in Bristol and in Cardiff. So actually, we've had a lot of support, but we've worked quite hard. I don't know if other people have got thoughts on that. 
Yeah, I guess if I'm honest, this isn't detracting how uh, tough, you know, that peak six week period was for nursing staff, for patients, for families and for everyone else. But actually that wave one, we had resources, we had hot food being delivered to the hospital by Michelin starred restaurants. Everybody was on board. There were people clapping. The government were saying words like intensive care. Uh, the word intensivist went into the dictionary in May for the first time. So actually that acute period was really hard. Of course it was, but it was also um, easier in some ways than the pressure that the NHS is under. And my, my, I guess my concern going forward is that that remaining when the other resources are not there in subsequent times will be the hard time. You know, summer is normally the time where the NHS is slightly has slightly more time to recover before a winter. And now, of course, we're going into winter without that recovery time almost. So, um, so yeah, that, that may help. Yeah, I could also um, answer this from a, a scientist's point of view in that, you know, it sort of really restricted our ability to do experiments in the past. But now, you know, that, that um, we've got good procedures in place, we're going to start to kick on ahead with this and really um, use COVID-19 as a, as a launching platform for new um, virus research. So really excited about getting back to work, but it has been very challenging, yes. Okay. We have a, a, the next question also is more related to between on the uh, clinical side, um, obviously connected in, and stimulated by uh, David's question. So the question is, hi there, just wondering whether the stories about the severely unwell patients like David, were who were heard such a, who had such an inspiring story is still occurring, and whether we aren't having the level of symptoms or that the level of symptoms are occurring so frequently because perhaps treatment outcomes have evolved over the pandemic. So I think this is a, a question as to whether, in fact, it's the learning lessons very early on and whether that's helped improve and. Maybe Matt and then obviously maybe Gus and others, David, would like to comment as well. Yeah, I guess there's there's definitely been lessons learned. And of course, this was a brand new virus we didn't understand or know much about. So there are ways we do things now which are different from before. I guess we can class those into two main ways. And that would be what supportive things do we use differently? In other words, how do we add oxygen and various other things? And really importantly, what treatments that we have now that we didn't the treatments have mainly resulted from big well conducted clinical trials and the uk should be really proud about this they gone out there really quickly and delivered huge clinical trials which is unheard of uh, the, the two big ones i guess a recovery study run by oxford although we recruited in Cardiff, probably the highest proportion of uh, the population of anywhere in the country, although there are 170 centres everywhere. And that has shown that a cheap, simple steroid, dexamethasone, can reduce deaths on a ventilator, the kind of stories that David you know, explained so well, by as much as a third. And that's remarkable. Uh, and this costs pennies. It's available in countries all over the world. The other study was the remap cap study which uses a slightly different steroid and that again has shown death benefits in using these steroid drugs and there's others along the way we've heard of interferon there's another one remdesivir so there are definitely new treatments we know about and then i guess briefly the supportive treatments we, we, we at the early stage of the pandemic we used ventilators probably more than oxygen via the mouth um, or via the nose and I think more and more we've seen that these other means of giving oxygen especially in conjunction with steroids would probably help reduce people needing to have breathing machines although the evidence is still vague and out there so if in the future this happens again if there is wave two then it would definitely look different just because of these powerful treatments we have and it's thanks to patients and their families like Davies and others who are included in the, this research that we've got those things really. Gus do you want to make any comments? I would that? simply echo that I mean I would love to have said that so eloquently really I think that we, there's just been a gradual improvement over time and you can see that in the data both and in, and in the stories I think. Yes no, I, I quite agree I mean uh, this is the 
I would like to also just emphasize that Matt pointed out was the involvement and participation in, in research. Mm. So patients willing and consenting and families consenting for that is absolutely critical. And it's only through that, that participation that actually improves and knowing where improvements in outcome can be. So that's something that is a, has to be a clear message given out to, to everybody. We have uh, the next question, which is um, really about the specificity. So if we know the cause of sepsis, like pancreatitis or biliary infection, and patients are on antibiotics, having COVID-19 presenting sepsis, is it worth switching the antibiotics to broad spectrum? So I'm not sure where this is coming from, but clearly the, the, the issue is that if you just knowing the particular bug that's causing sepsis is sometimes really tricky. I mean, most of the time you don't see the bug. And as Gus had pointed out in his talk, you may not detect uh, the COVID virus, the coronavirus, but you may well have COVID-19. <laughs> so it's a really tough call in terms of then just simply switching. Um, I don't know if that aren't, sort of hits the right question. Um, if maybe Gus, you would like to kick off yeah. on that? Maybe I mean, I think it's changed over time. So I think right at the start, everyone was getting very broad spectrum antimicrobials on presentation because we weren't sure. And over time, certainly when I've been going to the ITUs and our daily ward rounds, we've been getting more confident that that isn't necessary because our experience has grown that early in co-infection is quite rare. Late co-infection is a slightly different story when people have been on ventilators for some time, but certainly when people are presenting with COVID-19, we have discovered they don't really need antibacterials alongside that. But that, that, that's taken time to work out and, and studies. So that, that's changed over time, really. Yeah, and I guess we also have the benefit of tools, which again have come through, we've talked about clinical research, but basic science research, the type that Peter and Fergus and, and many others and Luke does is just as critical. You know, we have markers now that can help distinguish between bacterial infection. So we, we are using a new one called procalcitonin, for example, which may be helpful in stopping antibiotics. Uh, that later territory then of COVID is tough. And we've talked about bacterial sepsis, we've talked about viral. What we haven't mentioned is fungal disease. And we know in COVID-19, there's a relatively high rate of invasive fungal disease, much like there is in influenza, actually. And that's often at a later stage of the, of the disease in people who are severely ill, much like David. But thankfully, because he had you know, active intervention uh, from, from ECMO in this case, he didn't go on to need ongoing uh, very long ventilation so it, it's tough uh, but there there's a huge advantage to basic science and investing in basic science to have the markers so you can treat people appropriately yes i think many of the responses that we've just heard also addresses uh, kate uh, katupia's uh, question which is uh, she's so i'm kate an icu nurse uh, from kenya i am curious about the first line medical management for COVID-19 medication wise and has this changed with the second wave? Well the second wave hasn't yet <laughs> really hit but uh, clearly um, as, as we've been hearing those new medications and opportunities for intervention are coming online. I don't know if um, Matt you want to emphasize anything to Kate? Uh, yeah, I guess we've talked about steroids. And so, you know, if, if I had COVID-19, if any of my family were unwell and I was on oxygen, the evidence is that steroids are helpful and should be given. That's certainly the case in intensive care. It's difficult to know which steroid, dexamethasone or hydrocortisone, both have evidence now. I guess the one thing we haven't spoken about, which is a big issue in COVID-19, and David mentioned a stroke, which thankfully... You know, he's, he's recovered really well from, but we know this virus causes blood clotting and it can cause clots in the head, in the lungs, in the heart, lots of places. And so there's an there's a uncertainty at the minute about how we prevent those blood clots. Mm -hmm. In intensive care, we certainly look for them a lot more than we did before and we treat them if we find them, but there may be a case of increasing the medications we use to prevent blood clots from happening. 
and there's a trial going on at the minute doing that very thing. So that's one other component to, to throw in there. Yes, and of course, this is a sort of more general feature for sepsis as well. So it's not just specific to COVID-19. Uh, a jump on there as well. The, the cells I was talking about, those neutrophils, have been implicated in COVID-19 for causing those blood, clot, blood, blood clots. The exploding cell releasing all those toxic compounds in DNA then causes these, these clots to form as well. So perhaps stopping that would be another treatment strategy. The next question we have is, can you assist with the concept of viral load and whether one person uh, spread the virus more widely than others because of how much virus um, I think they, they have. Um, I would say that yes, the more virus you are shedding, the higher the probability that you will pass it on. Um, I, I open it up to any, any, any of the panelists that want to add to that, but I think... I mean, I, I think doing these sort of studies is so difficult because you, A, have to measure the viral load very accurately, and we know that just from a DNA testing, that can, the RNA testing that can be quite unreliable. Then you have to accurately measure who they did they infected or didn't infect and what correlates there were, you know, were they in a bus, in a school? And I'm sure in a year's time, someone will very accurately answer that question. But it's very difficult to answer it accurately beforehand, although it does make logical sense, like Peter says, that those with higher viral loads are possibly more infectious. The evidence for that is scant, but understandably so. Okay, very good. Uh, Luke, would you like to um, repeat the next question and respond to that? Okay. Cytokine storm and immune response. Is there a role for vitamin D supplementation during winter to help fight RTIs, COVID, flu, etc.? Vitamin D levels for those indoors during the summer will be low also. Um, treatments from randomized control trials have not been carried out for vitamin D, unlike steroid trials, et cetera. Now, I'm, I'm, I'm pretty sure I can't answer this with clinical details. I'll leave that to the clinical panelists, but um, certainly from my reading, um, it's very difficult um, to get vitamin D into people um, through supplements. It does, it does help if you, if you take supplemental vitamin D, but sunlight is always the best case. So this is why these studies are so difficult to do and you need a lot of numbers. And I think uh, one of the clinicians could probably answer this better than me. My, my only view of vitamin D, and I, I must admit I was a failed grant application to look at vitamin D in COVID-19, so I'm slightly bitter about it. Um, is that it has been tried in numerous infection conditions with very, very supportive observational data and then failed in larger scale trials. So I think my kind of gut feeling whether or not it's important is probably not. I think we should, we should evaluate it, but it is clearly involved in the immune response, but is it causal, like Luke says, does giving me more vitamin D make me less likely to, to die from coronavirus? That hasn't been shown in other infections despite supporting data. So I think we have to be slightly skeptical so far. Yes, I mean, the, the, clearly vitamin D is an important uh, part of, of the immune system and you, is required for that. And I think it was the old studies with tuberculosis that really showed uh, some of the benef benefits. Um, but yes, I mean, it, it's... The TB data when, is... When you take any vitamin supplements, you generally will urinate those pretty fast out of your system. So whether they are effective in terms of what they, they're meant to do is, is, is questionable. Another thing there is that winter's a time when people come together. So, you know, the spread of viral disease, that's the perfect time for them anyway. So, you know, a lot of the correlations have been done, but is it really vitamin D or sunlight? It's, it's very difficult to tell, really. Okay, so we have a, um, a question from Alex Tweedley with uh, COVID-19, with will COVID-19 weaken? and die out within two years, like previous virus infections, such as SARS and MERS have done. Maybe I'll just start that and then I'll allow the panelists, other panelists to, to come in with that. So the, the distinguishing, so currently um, on the planet that we know about, there's about 11 uh, coronaviruses, um, of which the MERS, which is the Middle Eastern respiratory virus is one of those. Unlike um, other coronaviruses that have jumped into humans, uh, the coronavirus 2 virus, which is the SARS virus um, that causes COVID-19, is far more infectious than, than other SARS viruses. So you can't exactly compare the two. 
Um, so what we have is a virus that's jumped into humans that is actually a lot more infectious than other previous coronavirus infections. Um, and it's the ability of this virus to spread quite um, rapidly and easily amongst humans that is the, has, has created this um, pandemic uh, situation that we're, we're in. The only way that we're going to really um, reg regulate that will be through vaccination, uh, vaccination schemes that will um, slow the spread of the virus. Um, however, the virus is with us and it will probably be, will probably be with us for some time to come. And it's, it's, it has clearly made an established foothold in the human population and I can't see it being eliminated in that context. And, just open it up to the rest of the panel to comment. Yeah, I think it's probably endemic for now, given this high efficiency of reproduction until vaccination occurs. And you're unlikely to vaccinate lots of parts of the world that very rapidly, so there's always going to be reservoirs. Okay, we have um, the next question. Uh, is from Paul Morgan. Given the difficulties of making bacterial, viral, and fungal diagnosis in sepsis, is there a future in using agents to modify the immune response to infection, bearing in mind past failures with our examples of activated protein C? Um, I think this is a really good question. It involves both the science and the clinical end of things. Luke, do you want to start off with that and then we move on to some of the clinical perspectives? Yeah, so I think the key thing here is that we, we just don't know enough. And that's from, you know, the basic science side, as well as, you know, we, when patients come in with a disease, we don't, we, our diagnostic tools are not good enough to be able to tell us what's going on it, you know, so that we can treat it in the best possible way. So I think until we know more, until we do more research, until, you know, we get that, those tools, we're not going to be able to have a successful, you know, this is not going to happen next year, for instance. We're going to need to put in that basic research and then, you know, we'll be able to, you know, have this bright future where we can detect a disease very easily and then treat it specifically, but certainly not next year. Yeah, I'd also make a comparison to cancer care in many ways. You know, cancer 20 years ago, you used to have an operation to chop it out and then have some chemotherapy. That was kind of cancer care. And now, of course, if you have cancer, we know the very mutation used in that specific subtype of lung cancer. You have a drug designed against that very mutation, and it's given. And at the minute, care for severe infection or sepsis is a bit like where cancer care was 20 years ago. If you've got an infected something, we cut it out, and we give you some strong antibiotics. You know, yes, we look at bug type, but we need to really put our money where we say personalized medicine that's there in cancer care it's not currently there in clinical sepsis care uh, i guess the question particularly about protein c is there was a drug uh, by a pharmaceutical company called eli Lilly that was marketed as being a brilliant drug for for sepsis as a syndrome and of course sepsis is a syndrome you know it's got lots of different diagnoses within it uh, and this drug was a big issue, be, not least because of the science, but because of some marketing issues. And, and it's a long, complex story I won't go into. But as a result, the pharmaceutical industry who you know, produce some of these compounds, they're at a tough place. You know, if you had to choose between making a drug which treats a chronic health condition like rheumatoid arthritis for 50 years or producing a drug which is only used once, and then that person's life is saved, that's a really difficult financial thing for a pharmaceutical company to do. So what we also need are new models of how we deliver these drugs. Should it be through insurance models? Should it be government investment? Should it be, it's difficult and there's no right answer. And it, the same goes for antibiotic resistance. So this isn't just a problem for science. This is a problem for, for the world. You know, how do we invest in drugs which aren't for long-term conditions like sepsis, li like other things. Yeah, so maybe if I can add just that to Paul's question, which is modifying the immune response. And I would, I would answer that question by saying that it's the patient's response, such as David's. I mean, yes, what intensive care does, and, and Matt, you can correct me on this, is to really allow the patient to survive a very difficult uh, physical uh, immune trauma, if you like, to their system. 
But in essence, the patients that recover actually revert back. So they come back to a resolution of where their immune response was at. And so it says that there are mechanisms, immune mechanisms that your own body does to help you recover uh, at the end from sepsis. If you didn't have that recovery period, then there would be, you would be on a, on a single trajectory um, of fatality. And so I think the patients that do recover and survive um, from COVID-19 and sepsis tell us that actually an intervention helping the immune system make that right decision, or as Luke had put it, the rheostat setting of the immune system may well be beneficial and helpful. Um, our next question we have um, uh, is from Marika uh, ne um, Nemekokova. I'm sorry if I pronounced your name incorrectly. She's a PhD student actually working on sepsis recognition. And, um, and the question is, do you think early recognition of sepsis in COVID-19 patients can improve patient outcomes? So I think that's right down at the front line. <laughs> You know, this is such a simple and such a difficult question. In fact, I had my PhD Viva and I thought it'd all be about science and probably half of it was about this question um, because like lots in science, science isn't actually about certainty. Science is all about uncertainties. It's what we don't know. Uh, and there is good data to say if you give antibiotics for people with bacterial sepsis early on, their outcomes are better. However, there's also data that says that's not as simple as that. Uh, and the reasons why are, are complex. It makes intuitive sense that if you treat something earlier, then the outcomes are better and prevention is better than cure. Um, do we have that evidence in COVID-19? Probably not at the minute. Um, the evidence with steroids, so early administration of steroids for people who are on oxygen, that's good. But bizarrely, people who are not on oxygen the steroid assistance is probably less helpful. So if you're too early, perhaps it's not helpful too. And this again comes back to this balance. Everything in life has risks and benefits. I wish I could answer your question simply. And um, that's why we're all here. That's why we're all working hard because we, we'd love to answer this. But right now, it's, it's a toughie. Yeah, I mean, just to echo Matt's point, I mean, the point about early antibiotics and sepsis, which you, you think is very simple and very easy, is actually still controversial to date with multiple people arguing about whether or not it's a value you know years after the trials that were positive and negative and so on have been done so i think we're going to struggle to answer this for some time it's a really difficult question yes i agree um okay so um we'll just take a few more questions and then we'll we'll, we'll close we'll close the session so we have uh, the next question um we have is have you noticed any link between blood group and severity of illness. It's been thrown about in the news, but seems speculative rather than analyzed. Um, maybe I'll just start off with a comment that um, the blood, I'm not sure about the association between the blood group, but certainly with your antigens that you have on your blood cells, the so-called HLA antigens, as with any infectious disease, there's always a, um, an association with a particular type of genetic um, haplotype or uh, HLA type that you would have that would make you either more susceptible or resistant to disease. And with COVID-19, I'm not aware of any uh, substantial research that has yet been done in this area. I don't know if any of the others would like to comment on that. Um, I think most of the data about blood group and viral infections come from norovirus, where there is some data that the blood group does affect whether or not you develop symptomatic norovirus. And I know that there has been a large GWAS study, which is a genetic study looking at associations with disease and particular gene changes that has shown one of the, blood, the genes that control blood group was possibly implicated, which may, may be the reason for the question. We had a look with some of our data. We looked at the blood group on about 80 or so patients in Bristol and found exactly what the, the question is, speculative really. I think it's actually something that will be come out in, again in the bit of the fullness of time. Um, we don't know people's blood group necessarily at the start of the infection and 
we need to take time to do the research to, to identify that. It's an interesting idea, though. Yeah, in fact, um, we, we published a paper looking at survival from all comers in intensive care with different blood groups, um, probably a, a two years or so ago. And in fact, there is a survival advantage for those with blood group AB, for example. Um, and there is some observational data, this is true in COVID. Again, the reasons why it is group just a surrogate marker for something. There are clearly ethnic differences in survival. Again, is blood group just a marker or a surrogate for those differences? There are differences in the way your blood clots with different blood groups. So uh, von Brillevin's factor is different in different blood groups. And in fact, group AB that we found are more likely to survive. That's different in trauma or cardiac surgery, which both involve bleeding. So there may be some contribution there as well. So brilliant question. There's a lot of observational work going on about it. Uh, and at the minute, the answer is maybe. <laughs> Yeah, I think that question came about because uh, I think there was a, a few studies published about um, having an increased risk with blood group A, but I don't think there's been enough done on that to, to give any solid conclusions yet. Yes, and that probably, we're going to end on, on the last uh, more uh, statement question, which is coming back to vitamin D, and is there a possibility to explore this area more rigorously than simply to be in denial mode? Uh, I don't think anybody's in denial mode. Um, as, as we've just discussed, there is the need to do a lot more extensive uh, research. There is a, an incredible opportunity from around the globe um, to do this in a very unique way with COVID-19. As Matt had pointed out right in the beginning of his talk, this is a very specific disease with a specific pathogen. And this allows you to really answer questions that have been really difficult in the past. Um, I don't think anybody discounts any possibility of investigating something rigorously. Well, certainly I, I'd be trying to do it if they gave me the cash, but they didn't. So <laughs> I'd be quite keen to do it. Um, I think the easiest way to do this would be to, to look at Mendelian randomization, which is where you look at natural variations. So we have natural variations, the level of vitamin D in, in, in across the sort of population. And we, we apply to have a look and see if those natural variations affected COVID outcomes, because those are quite well recorded in a big, big UK study called UK Biobank, which might be a neat way of, of looking at it without having to do too much work. But they never said yes anyway. So we'll never know. No, I think some other people are doing it. Yeah. And I think the broader question here, you know, the, the, the word denial strikes out in me and rightfully so. Science is under the spotlight in, in COVID. But again, as I said earlier, Science is not about certainties. It's all about uncertainties. Uh, that's what we thrive on, is trying to answer questions which are difficult to answer. If you look right now on clinicaltrials.gov, which is a, a registry of clinical trials, there are 30 trials just on vitamin D in the planning phase. Um, so you know, no matter how much evidence there is one way or another, it's, it's managing that uncertainty and there are people all over the world trying to deal with that. So, you know, there's a huge amount going on. Uh, I wish we could get answers, simple answers quickly, but sadly that's not how science often works and that's not how disease responds. Um, so, yeah. Yes, okay. I think we'll, um, we've had a spate of questions just coming in, as I said, we were closing down. I think I would just probably, I'm gonna let one uh, slip in from Gareth Jones. Um, which is really about wanting to get the thoughts from everybody on the panel about the possibility of being reinfected with coronavirus. And I know that this would resonate in particular for David on the panel. Um, so. I mean, I, I, th I think the epidemiological data is starting to come through of certainly cases of reinfection. I think it's important given the number of cases that have happened worldwide, this is a, a tiny, tiny, tiny fraction and certainly when we've had suspicions of reinfection here in Bristol, we've investigated that quite, quite thoroughly. So I think that the likelihood in the short term is, is quite low. Um, the longer term out, outlook from other coronaviruses is, is, is perhaps less optimistic. So the fact there was a paper published today suggesting that, you know, your immune today wanes after about six months to a year. And that's been reported by other people. But I think we just don't know the virus only really came out in in february and i think the biggest thing as matt has said is, is the uncertainty um and we have to be honest about that i think probably uh yes so if there's no other i mean my 
I think there's always one point to really um, make clear, and that is that uh, vaccines in your immune system are not designed to completely sterilize you from an infection. What vaccines do very well is to take where if you had a primary infection that was very acute and serious, that if you've educated your immune system to that pathogen, it prevents you from getting symptoms. So it takes you down to an asymptomatic state. So yes, I think it is very complicated. In situations, it's not going to prevent the virus from properly entering your body. But the question is, would, would that prevent you from getting disease again from that pathogen? And I think that's something that we won't know for sure until we actually do uh, a lot more research in that area. Okay, so on that note, I would like to thank uh, all the panelists, especially David, who obviously had first a very traumatic experience with COVID-19, Matt for uh, just a wonderful way to kick us off, um, and then hearing all of the complexities and the interaction, actually, Gus, is really nice to hear how all that the, the connections between the clinical end and the science. And of course, that's something that um, I would like to resonate that Matt had started us off with, which was to say that really the way forward for us is to actually embed science much more closely into medicine and for that interaction to continue as we go forward into the future and is the basis of what Project Sepsis is all about. So, um, and I thank everybody for your attention. And so with that, we say goodbye. Bye bye. Bye bye. Bye bye. Bye bye. Thank you. Thank you.